In this video, we'll look at the principles of congestion control, including what causes network congestion and the various approaches to deal with it. Let's get started. Now we'll look at the principles of congestion control, including what causes congestion in the first place. Fundamentally, congestion is the state where there is more data being sent into the network than the network can handle. We can observe that congestion is occurring when router buffers begin to fill, causing longer queuing delays, and when packets are dropped because buffers overflow. It is important to remember that congestion control and flow control are two completely different things. Flow control is preventing the sender from overwhelming the receiver, whereas congestion control is preventing the senders from overwhelming the network. Now we'll look at some scenarios. We've previously observed that it's typical for there to be a bottleneck link somewhere along the path between a source and a destination. In this scenario, there's a router feeding that link with a shared output buffer. The input and output link capacity in this case are both R. We'll have two flows passing through these links. So host A is sending at lambda in, and the throughput that's making it through to the receiver is lambda out. Host B is also sending a flow which is sharing bandwidth on the same link. Now in this contrived scenario, the router's buffer is of infinite size, so there will be no retransmissions needed because any excess data sent will just be stored in the buffer until it can be transmitted. There may, however, be very high delays. In fact, we know that as each of the senders approaches sending R over 2, the link will approach saturation and our delays will grow exponentially. The throughput for each of the two flows cannot exceed lambda over 2, no matter how much data the two hosts send. So that excess data will be stored in the buffer, causing a dramatic increase in queuing delay. Of course, we know that in real systems, the buffers are not infinite, and so the queuing delay will be limited by the size of the buffer. This also means that the buffer will drop packets, which means that they will have to be retransmitted. So our efficiency will decrease because we are now having to retransmit packets that were lost. So our application is sending at a rate of lambda in. But once we account for the retransmissions, we have a rate of lambda prime in, which is higher than lambda in that needs to be sent over the network. Lambda out is the data that is delivered to the application, which will be the same as lambda in and less than lambda prime in. Now in the ideal case, the sender would transmit only when there is room in the buffer for a packet. However, these router buffers are operating at a different layer. They're not part of the transport protocol, and there is typically no signaling between the router buffer and the transport protocol. So the sender does not have this perfect information about whether there's room in the buffer. But in any case, the ideal operational point is when both senders are sending exactly R over two data and not causing congestion. Short of knowing exactly when there's room in the buffer, the sender might hope to know when a packet has been lost and needs to be retransmitted. In this scenario, packets are only retransmitted when they're lost, but because there is some loss in retransmission, the lambda out rate will be lower than the lambda prime rate, which means we're wasting some capacity on the network. Unfortunately, the real situation is even a bit worse than this in that the sender doesn't know for certain when a packet has been lost and in some cases will retransmit packets unnecessarily, which causes further bandwidth to be wasted on the network. So we show this as an additional reduction in efficiency where the output rate for the drops below R over 2. So ultimately, the cost of congestion is more congestion because it causes retransmissions, which decrease the maximum achievable throughput. In our scenario with only one router, these costs were minimal. However, as we traverse more and more hops in the network, we see these costs having greater effects. Here we have a flow from A to C, traversing two buffers on its way. We also have a flow from D to B, which is sharing one of those buffers. The flow from B to D takes a different path, again sharing a buffer. And lastly, we add the flow from C to A. So as host A sends more and more data to host C, it will cause more and more packets to be dropped, which will negatively impact the flow between D and B. However, as these packets are being dropped at their second router, they've already consumed resources on the first router that they flowed through. And those resources are now wasted. So we know that our throughput can never exceed capacity. And we also know that as we try to use all of the capacity in a packet switch network, the queuing delay increases exponentially. Loss and retransmissions take a bite out of our available bandwidth. And if there's unneeded retransmissions, they further reduce our efficiency. And any packets that are dropped waste any resources that they have consumed before the point in the network at which they are dropped. 
Now let's put this in context of the network stack. The congestion we're discussing is happening at layer three and lower devices, which does not explicitly communicate with the transport layer. But the transport layer does observe when packets are lost or delayed, and so it can make inferences about the state of the network below it. This is how TCP is able to have a congestion control approach, even though congestion does not happen at the transport layer. Another approach which has been implemented in non-IP networks is that the network provides direct feedback about congestion and explicitly communicates with the sending and receiving host to address it. This was one of the features of the ATM and DECBIT protocols, but was not included in the internet protocol stack due to complexity. However, there is a TCP option called ECN, or Explicit Congestion Notification, that takes a step towards including this sort of mechanism, and we'll see more details on that later. That wraps up our discussion of the principles of congestion control, and in the next video, we'll see how TCP implements them. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.